This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. My guest today is Professor James Otteson, Notre Dame, and we are talking seven deadly economic sins. James has that pragmatic, for lack of a better term, maybe he likes this term, libertarian background. So for those of you that know, I went to George Mason University. Many of the economists there all have appeared on this show I think James fits in nicely with that group. He might argue that point. I'm not sure. That's just my perspective. Now, I'm not going to go into it in this intro, but these seven deadly economic sins, these are the things that if you could wrap your mind around it, wrap your feelings around it, and implement, he's got the perspective. James has the perspective for prosperity and happiness. And if you, Mr. Average Joe out there, would like a little bit more of this prosperity and happiness in your life, I think James Otteson has some strong insights. Pay attention. These conversations are always fun. A little philosophical, but that's okay. I love that kind of stuff. Where do you find that kind of stuff, right? I go digging. I find you the guests that you don't know. These super smart people that are kind of under the radar. Without any further delay, let's jump right into my guest today, James Otteson. In advance of this call, James, I was thinking to myself, one of my favorite guilty pleasure movies is V for Vendetta. I don't know if you've seen it, It's been a while. I saw it when it came out, but that's been, what, 15 years, 20 years? There's a lot in that film, a lot of things going on from the Guy Fawkes mask to the personal responsibility measures to the desire to overcome a government that's reached too far and all these kinds of things. And we could probably have all kinds of topical conversations about things going on. Perhaps we'll bring up some things, but I guess the opening salvo where I want to come with you, and I think you'll have a good working definition. and I don't think I've asked this on this podcast since inception, and I'm approaching a thousand episodes. What is morality today? Give us a good working definition, because I don't ever hear that word really talked about much. It just is these political battles and whatnot, but there used to be this galvanizing fiber that we could all kind of latch onto and say, well, that's moral. Is there some universal perspective on morality, morals? Well, I guess I'd like to think that there is. I believe there is, although people's opinions about it differ quite a bit. Philosophers distinguish between what they call ethics and what they call meta-ethics. Ethics is what's right and wrong, the things you should do, the things you should not do. Meta-ethics is at the next level up. That's really a theory about why something that is the right thing to do is the right thing to do. So it's really giving you a theory about what makes something moral as opposed to what is moral. And there's a lot of philosophical and also academic discussion about what the right theory would be. And that's where a lot of the controversy is. There tends to be, at least among academics or scholars, there tends to be less disagreement about the first level of ethics. There's a lot of agreement or consensus about at least some basic rules of morality. But I think what you might be thinking about or what you might be putting your finger on is that It's not clear that that consensus is holding anymore. There's quite a bit of disagreement, even about sort of the everyday things. Take an injunction like you should tell the truth. We could argue about why it is telling the truth is the right thing to do, what the theory is. Maybe there's something about natural law or maybe there's something about human virtue. You can't be a virtuous human being if you don't tell the truth. But I think in practice, there is a growing, I won't say consensus, but a growing view that something like telling the truth is conditional. In other words, you should tell the truth only when it gives you some kind of advantage or when it benefits you in some way. 
as opposed to just having sort of a principled view about telling the truth. And I think that really is something that is growing. And the way I would capture that or characterize that is by saying there is a view of morality that there are certain things a person ought to do or ought not to do as a matter of principle. So this is a matter of your character and the sort of person you are because you want to and should want to be a virtuous person on the one hand. On the other hand, there is also the view that's, I think, increasingly prevalent in society that all the rules of morality really are contingent on whether they benefit me or my group or my family or my tribe or not. That's a dangerous thing, not just sort of practically because it can pit people against one another, but I think also civilization depends on people being able to count on one another and to trust one another. The only way you can really count on other people, especially people you don't know, the people you deal with in a large cosmopolitan society or in the market, you have to be able to trust them. And the only way you're going to trust them is if they accept certain rules as principled, as part of their character. They won't steal from you, not because they might get caught or not because they might get in trouble if they do, but just through force of their own character. To address your first question, which is what is morality? What I would say is a moral person is a person who has certain moral principles that you follow by force of your character, not necessarily whether they in the moment or on the spot benefit you or not. You give an explanation that I might as a guy not in your field, on the outside looking in, smart enough to have a conversation with you, but not as detailed as you, I might characterize what you just said is a very learned academic explanation for, and I'm going to try to simplify here and tell me if I'm completely off base, that truth no longer has one truth. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm old fashioned enough, old school enough to think that there is such a thing as truth in the following sense. So going all the way back to Aristotle, Aristotle offered what is sometimes called the correspondence theory of truth. The correspondence theory of truth says there is an external world and that world is independent of our desires and our wishes and our perceptions of it. And a statement or a hypothesis or a proposition is true if what it holds is actually the case in that external world. And if you believe that there is an external world, a world that is independent of our wishes and desires, etc., then that means that there are certain things that are the case in that world, regardless of whether we want them to be the case or not. I would say that that definition of truth is not only the one that enables us to have scientific knowledge, to have knowledge that can lead to technological progress, to medicinal progress, but I think that stands in opposition to the view that you're right. You hear a lot with increasing frequency about, well, I have my truth and you have your truth. I mean, there is a kernel of truth, pardon the pun, to that. If I say, well, my perception of that movie is that it's not very good and your perception of that movie is that it is good. Well, OK, then you have your view and I have mine. Those kinds of claims about whether I like something or don't like something, those aren't claims so much about picking out facts in the world as about speaking about my own situation. So my perception of something is that I don't like it and yours is that you do like it. But that's very different from making a claim about the world, an empirical fact or an alleged empirical fact about the world. And in that case, I think it's very important for us to recognize that there is an external world, even if we don't completely understand it or we don't completely agree on how to interpret it, there is still an external world and we can strive to more closely approximate true beliefs about that world. And I think that's something very important to hold on to. That's really what gives us an ability to speak to one another. If everybody has his or her own individual truth, then there's really no way for us to be able to communicate. Then I can't explain anything to you. I can't understand anything that you say. And the same is true for me. That's really extremely dangerous to human society. I think it jeopardizes human sociality. Is that not America today? Alas, I think it's increasingly so, but I haven't given up hope. I think one of the mistakes we often make is to think that, well, you are a person of type X, which means you are a member of group X. As a member of group X, then I can conclude the following things about you. And you might think the same thing about me, really just a representative of a group as opposed to an individual speaking on my own behalf. 
the more that we see one another as merely representatives of groups, I think the more destructive that is. First of all, I think it's not true to go back to the earlier point you were making. People aren't merely representatives of groups. They're individuals. They are individual souls. They are moral agents who can and should speak for themselves and own their own words and own their own ideas. But on the other hand, it also means that we diminish one another and put each other into these sort of tribalistic groups that pit one group against another. And I think that too is very destructive. These days, a lot of people are openly and actively putting themselves in the tribe, accepting whatever the parameters are for that tribe and just accepting it no matter what. I mean, I'm at a point now, I cannot have certain conversations in public with certain people. I love your work in the sense that look how detailed you are in the first 10 minutes. I mean, you are taking this down to the granular level. Now, let's face it, you and I both know the vast majority of Americans, if we're going to pick on Americans for a moment, since we're both American, the vast majority of Americans do not want to go to the granular level. They want to stay at the emotional level. They do not want to get down to the nitty gritty and to really start to unpack all these issues. If I was to look at America right now, it seems like it really is, to generalize, two groups that are accepting the tribal identity. And probably both of those groups don't truly understand what each tribal identity actually represents. Frankly, I'm not really sure those tribes represent anything close to what the people that might accept those tribes represent. It's really got it messy and confusing, and it just seems so emotional. Like I said, the first 10 minutes, you're sitting here and you're like taking it down, granular, granular, granular. And then I have to do with the comeback and say, my God, how do you crack the nut on so many people that don't want to do that? Yeah. Well, you're being very pessimistic this morning. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be more optimistic, although I feel the force of what you're saying. Look, I think a lot of it has to do with what I think of as the corruption of human society of politics. Politics plays such a huge role in our lives, and so many people stake their identity on their political outlook and also the political, to use the word you just mentioned, the political sort of tribe that they belong to. I mean, look, in many ways, having a group identity is fine and is maybe even productive. So maybe somebody is a New York Yankees fan and somebody else is a Boston Red Sox fan. They really love their team, and that can lead to a productive and even fun rivalry. There really isn't anything destructive about that. That's just part of being human and engaging in a kind of repartee about, I like my team and you like your team and that's fine. But when you transfer that to politics, that I think is where things can get much more dangerous because it's easy for us to just stay. If I immediately, without learning anything about you as a person, if I just put you in a group, well, then it's easy for me to judge you. It's easy for me to dismiss you because you're just a member of that group and you're sort of fungible or interchangeable with anybody else in that group. That can give me a feeling of superiority if I perceive myself or identify myself as being a member of a different group that I think is better than your group. But I think that's really dangerous and potentially destructive. If your question is, is that increasingly happening in America today? I think the answer to that is yes. But if the question is, well, what can we do about it? That's obviously much harder. But I think one of the things we can do is remind ourselves that we aren't merely members of groups. We are individuals. We're unique and precious individuals. I think we should remind ourselves of one of the great achievements of our culture and of America, which is we don't want to judge people on the basis of whether we think they're a member of a group or not. We want to judge them as individuals, and we want to see other people as being moral agents of dignity and put aside things that are, to the extent that we can, irrelevant about them, unchosen characteristics. And it is possible for people in different groups to still be friends, to still work together, to be professional, to be collegial. Reminding ourselves of the importance of that, I think, is something that can actually Maybe I'm being too optimistic. You're going to accuse me of being even naive. But I think what that can do is remind us that although there can be a certain rush or thrill of emotion by condemning other people or condemning groups of people, we are better than that. And we should be better than that. We shouldn't rush to condemn. I think the word identity is this one. If America does ultimately have some kind of a break in the future, it's going to come down to something like identity. 
I talk to a lot of different people in this podcast and I get pitched a lot of different types of guests. And I regularly just delete emails where the guest is not going to tell me their philosophy of business, their philosophy of art, their philosophy of science, or their skill in that, but just identity. I don't know the kind of conversation I'm supposed to have. Martin Luther King kind of gave the speech and told us where we should all be. I can't do it better than he did it. Here I am in 2021. I want to know about you, your philosophy. I want to know how you think. I want to know all the pieces that brought you to how you make decisions, why you make decisions. I don't give a rat's you know what about what color you are, what gender you are, what color your hair is, what color your clothes are, how tall you are, where your nationality is. I just don't care. I think more people need to start saying that, (laughs) you know? Yeah, you're right. I mean, you said you couldn't say it better than Martin Luther King Jr. I don't think anybody could have said it better than, (laughs) than he did, but I think that that's still an important ideal that's worth internalizing. When we're judging another person, we judge a person as an individual and on the merits. That is a view that most Americans, and maybe in other countries as well, but I think that's a view that most Americans in their heart of hearts do hold to. I think there probably is still a majority of people who think that that's really the right way to treat other people. You don't judge them or prejudge them. I mean, that's what the word prejudice means. You prejudge them based on some category that you think they're a member of or a group that you think they're a member of. Because it's not the case that everybody who's a member of some kind of group is identical. They aren't. People have individual characters. They have skills and abilities and histories that are different and unique to each one of them. And I think that that's an important ideal to still hold on to and to remind ourselves to live up to. One side tangent, since I am calling you from a pretty homogenous country, you kind of walk around in a particular country, almost every country except America, frankly. I mean, America is this melting pot, but there is a lack of diversity and a more homogenous population in many of the countries around the world. And that becomes a whole different conversation and a whole different issue. Why did that happen? A strength in their homogeneity. And America is the great experiment. We'll just have to see in the future how it unfolds. I don't want to take you down that path yet, or even maybe tonight. But where I want to go today is I want to open this up to a little bit of uh economic thought. And I'm going to start with one because it's a concept that I wrote about in my first book. And I can't remember where, I think I first heard about it in practical writing from, at the time, he might still be, he was the chair of finance at the University of Southern California, a guy named Larry Harris. He wrote about the concept of zero sum. And zero sum specifically in trading, it was probably more specifically in futures markets. And there's no doubt that in futures markets, it is a zero-sum game. I think that that, even though most people don't necessarily get it all, we're looking at this whole short selling scandal that's going on right now where it's like one side of each coin, there's you know potentially the hedge funds going short and the little guys going long. But when it comes to wealth, when it comes to prosperity, we across the world get it wrong, don't we, to think that Just because Jeff Bezos developed the most cool idea that took off and it held a lot of luck involved in all of his smart decisions, it's not just all skill. No one can say skill, you just make 150 billion bucks. But why don't you speak to this notion of a positive sum game? If we lose hope that we don't have a chance and we believe everything is a zero sum game in life, we're really in trouble, aren't we? Yeah, we sure are. I think you're right. I think we tend to see the entire world as if it were all zero-sum transactions. There are lots of games, as it were, lots of kinds of exchanges that really are zero-sum. If you and I play a game of chess, well, one of us wins, that means the other one has to lose. If the Yankees and the Red Sox play, well, one will win, the other will lose. That's zero-sum. But there are other applications of zero-sum that have taken place in the past and continue to take place now. But not all exchanges are zero sum. Go back in history for just a minute. Think about the Egyptian pharaohs who built those pyramids. Well, it took a lot of wealth and prosperity and capital to build those pyramids. Where did they get it? Or think about the Roman Empire with its aqueducts and Colosseum. And that took a lot of capital to build all that. Where did they get it? Well, where they got it was by conquest, enslaving, forced labor, 
all of that is zero sum transactions. So you can think about this on a much more micro level, just you and I suppose if you have a laptop and I would like to have your laptop, one way I could get it from you is just by stealing it from you. If I steal your laptop from you, that's a zero sum transaction. That means minus one laptop for you, plus one laptop for me, minus one plus plus one, that's zero. That's the name, zero sum. And that exchange, a zero sum transaction like that, is really what has characterized human history throughout almost all of its history. What people did, as soon as anybody got enough power over another, what they would do is just go and take all of their stuff. But that's not generating new wealth or net increase in wealth. All that's doing is moving wealth from one place to another. I go to the beach and I say, I build a sandcastle and I say, look at my creation. Look at all this new sand I created. Well, no, you didn't create any new sand. You just moved it from one place to another. Those are all zero sum transactions. But here's the key. It's also possible to have positive sum transactions. And again, you can see this just on the micro level. You go into Starbucks and you order your double pumpkin spice mocha latte and the barista says that'll be $5. You give $5, you get your latte. Which of you benefited from that transaction? Well, the answer is both of you did. And we know that both of you had to benefit from it because if Starbucks said that'll be $50, you would have said no thanks and gone somewhere else. On the other hand, if you offered $1, Starbucks would have said no thanks and moved on to the next customer. The fact that you both said yes means that both of you feel as though you benefited from the transaction. You valued the latte more than the $5 you paid for it. Starbucks valued the $5 more than the latte which means both of you benefit. A positive value on one side plus a positive value on the other side is a net positive or a positive sum transaction. The key there, and I think this is what you're getting at, the key there is that that's how general prosperity is created. When you have transactions like that or exchanges or partnerships like that, you have them hundreds, thousands, millions, even billions of them, that begins, even if it's just each one is only incremental, they generate slightly more prosperity. And what really changed the world is that around 1800 or so in some parts of the world, people started to think maybe extracting wealth from other people through zero sum transactions isn't the most moral way to deal with others. Maybe a better way to deal with people is to make them an offer that they're free to say yes to or to say no to. And as that idea began to spread, you got more and more mutually voluntary and then mutually beneficial positive sum transactions. And that's really the story of wealth. So the wealth we have today is almost entirely owing to the billions of positive sum transactions like that. It does seem like, and I'm sure you can guess by my tone, what side of the fence I might come down, but it does seem like that a significant number of Americans, and perhaps I can extrapolate out across the world, those people that don't have what they feel like they should have, and those people that have somehow or another, either on purpose or just ignorance, have missed the notion of entrepreneurial ambition. The whole Starbucks story you just gave, and then to imagine that and extrapolate it out. Instead of looking at the world like that and saying, oh my gosh, and we've got the internet in the last 25 years, oh my gosh, I can set up my lemonade stand, so to speak, figuratively, and sell anything to everybody. And the enthusiasm, the excitement from that is so awesome. Whereas I do think, I don't think I'm exaggerating here. I think it's a very large part of a population. And if I wasn't talking to you on a podcast, I would say it's 50% of the population does not agree with me that they cannot start that entrepreneurial ambition. They can't think that way because the game is rigged against them and they don't have a chance. And what you just properly described is a positive sum game. Yeah, I think you may have a point. And in many cases, it is true. I mean, one of the things that interests me is when we do these surveys and we ask people, you know, we ask millennials in America, do you support capitalism or do you support socialism? And you know, we get these results. One of the things I find interesting is that when people are asked about whether they support capitalism, they understand by that term different things. And one of the things it turns out that many of them understand by the term capitalism is what I would call cronyism. Cronyism is a different kind of thing. Cronyism is when you have 
entrenched firms or interests that get the rules tilted in their favor to protect them against competition, to protect them against losses, you know, maybe subsidize their losses, to impose regulations that make it more difficult for new entrants or new competitors into the market, so to protect their market share. There's a lot of that that goes on in the world, including in the United States. Some of the objection I think people have to a market economy or a commercial society is really that. What they're really seeing is that, well, isn't it the case that firms or powerful people in the economy, they go and send an army of lobbyists to Washington, D.C., and this army of lobbyists makes it much more difficult for anybody to compete against them or start out at the beginning. I think there's a lot of justice in the complaint that, hey, some of these rules are tilted against us. What's amazing about that perspective, though, and there's a famous clip You might have seen this over the years with Milton Friedman on Donahue's couch back in the 70s. Donahue's saying, oh, you know, all these capitalists and they're just bad actors and this and that. And Friedman kind of plays along and I'm paraphrasing here. And he says something to the effect of like, well, that's great. The government's going to do everything. You know, are you actually trying to tell me that the people in government are like angels to take care of you? You actually imagine these people in Washington, D.C. are angels looking out for your best interest? No, they're looking out for their self-interest, which is to get elected. Yeah, that's a mistake we tend to make, which is we think some groups of people are not subject to the normal human frailties and biases and other people are. Human beings, whether in government or in business or in academia, where I am, we're all just people. We have a lot of the same motivations and the same biases that anybody else has in any other walk of life. What that does highlight, though, talked about cronyism. There is that one of the insights, if you can call it an insight, one of the things that if you study economics that economists frequently ask is if you identify a problem. That's step one. Step two is, well, what are we going to do about it? And when you get to step two, what could we do about it? You always have to ask the question, compared to what? Because a lot of times solutions that people propose to problems either lead to their own set of issues, including negative consequences, often unintended negative consequences, or they can even be worse than the disease. The cure can be worse than the disease. Are you talking about COVID in 2020? <laughs> Ah, so you want to get me to talk about that too. (laughs) I love to keep these conversations timeless in many ways, but COVID in 2020, if someone, I'm sure many people in the audience are thinking, oh my gosh, that was such a Petri dish of everything you just said. Oh yeah, I'm happy to talk about that. But the only thing I was going to say about business is if you're going to succeed in a market economy as a business person or as an entrepreneur or as a company, if you're going to succeed in a market economy, The only way you're going to be able to succeed is by figuring out what other people want and giving it to them. We tend to think that the opposite is the case, that business people are only in it for themselves. Well, if you're thinking about being a business person or you're thinking about being an entrepreneur and the only one you care about is yourself, you're going to go out of business in a New York minute because the only way you can succeed is if you offer other people something that they value enough to part with some of their time or talent or treasure to procure. So they have to value it enough to give up some scarce resource they have to get what you're offering, which means you have to relentlessly think about other people. An entrepreneur or a business person is what gives that person gray hairs? Well, you're up at night thinking about your employees, your customers, your clients, the partners in logistics. You're thinking about all of these other people. If you're successful, it means that you're able to give other people something that they themselves value because you know in a market Other people are exquisitely finicky. They will stop going to your coffee shop. They will stop going to your retail outlet in a heartbeat. If there's something they don't like, they don't like the price. Everyone used BlackBerry, and then Steve Jobs showed up and said, here's something you didn't imagine, and now everyone uses an iPhone. Right. To be successful, especially successful on a large scale, you have to be constantly thinking about not only what do other people want, but what will they want tomorrow and in a week and in a month and a year. And if you try to spend 30 seconds trying to guess where our customs and fashions and preferences going to go a month from now or six months or a year from now, that's not easy. In order to succeed, you really have to be constantly thinking about everybody else. It's the iteration, the iteration mindset. And what you're really getting at, from my perspective, I'm looking at some thoughts here, is This expert mindset, so many people think there's this expert mindset out there. If you go back and you kind of like listen to a Jeff Bezos, he's like, we just made a lot of experiments. A lot of things didn't work. 
then they caught the wave and it took off and all that whatnot. But we really do, and you hinted at this a moment ago, but we really do have this mindset in the modern world that there are these experts, these brilliant minds. I hate to pick on him. Actually, I love to pick on him. I can't even think of all the ways I've picked on him in the last year. But there's a doctor in America who's been at the tip of the spear on corona stuff. I have no doubt that he is a highly competent, highly knowledgeable guy. But you know, when you tell everybody to wear a mask, and then you yourself are sitting in the baseball stands eating peanuts and without a care in the world and without a mask in the world, it's the hypocrisy of experts. I hate to not just pick on the one doctor, but it's the hypocrisy of experts that for me personally, I don't buy any of them. I'm back to what you said in the very beginning. Let me judge each person. Let me understand their skill, their philosophy, et cetera. But there are a ton of people that use the simple heuristic of, oh, that guy's a doctor. I trust him implicitly. I don't have to think. That's it. I follow. It's nuts to me. Yeah, I take your point. And I think a lot of people share that point. Here's what I would say about that. Maybe a slightly different perspective or a way to think about expert knowledge. I'm an academic, so I'm the last person to say there's no such thing as expert knowledge. But you have to think about wherein does expert knowledge consist? Take somebody who's an epidemiologist or somebody who's an expert in human nutrition, let's say. What's their knowledge going to be about? Well, their knowledge is going to be about averages, aggregate data across populations. If an expert says the average human being should have 2,500 calories a day, and should exercise for 45 minutes three times a week or something. Let's suppose this is what an expert says. That might be true in the following way. It applies to whole populations or across large numbers of people, and it's based on aggregate data. Here's what that doesn't tell you. Suppose it's true for all human beings that they should, on average, have 2,500 calories a day. What that doesn't tell you is how many calories you should have. Because what that expert doesn't know is, well, what kind of a lifestyle do you have? What particular physiological features do you have? What challenges do you face? What's your baseline? Right. Because they don't know that, that expert knowledge by itself can't tell you anything about what you yourself should do. And that goes across the line. It's not just about medicine. I mean, think about personal finance. Suppose an expert says, Americans really need to save more. They need to invest more. They need to save more. They need to take a longer time horizon. They need to buy more of GameStop. That's right. And pretty quickly. Suppose they give you that sort of general advice. Well, okay, but how much does that mean you should put away from your monthly paycheck pre-tax? Doesn't tell you. And it also doesn't say, well, when is a circumstance that arises in your life? When does that count as the rainy day when you should take money out of your IRA, let's say, or your 401k? None of that can actually tell you that. So you still have to use your own judgment. Individuals have to use their own judgment, in particular, in applying expert knowledge to their own individual circumstances. And I think that's hard to do, but that's how you can use expert knowledge. The mistake is to think that what might apply to a literally average person, therefore applies to everybody. We still have to apply, use our own individual judgment and by taking into consideration all of the particularities of each individual person's situation and perspective. And I think one of the mistakes we often make, we'll pass a regulation or a rule or a mandate or a law that would work if everybody were literally the same. But people are not the same. Those rules often don't apply or can even be counterproductive in individual circumstances. Not thinking is not an option is the short version of that, right? I mean, you know, so many people don't want to think. We all know there's an obesity problem in America. So in in many ways, I just imagine this visual of the individual on the couch. And look, I've been there at certain stages of the game and whatnot, but you're the individual on the couch and you just flip on the TV and you zone out and the cable news comes on and the shows come on and the junk food goes in and, you know, wash, rinse, repeat. But this is this mindset And all these issues that we're talking about, if we don't potentially get a handle on all of this, you go into this point that I'm about to make in your new book, our future progress is not inevitable, is it? If we don't 
have a good handle on everything. I think, you know, as Americans, we like to be like, we'll have a financial crisis. The Dow will go down 50 percent. It'll go up another 200 percent next week. The Fed will jerry rig things and we'll have minus 10 percent interest rates soon. And who the hell cares? And America, number one, and everything goes up. This is just not the case. <laughs> that is absolutely not the case. I mean, you don't have to take too much of a historical perspective. I mean, you have to zoom out from five minutes, but think about human history over the last couple hundred years. It turns out that peaceful, prosperous societies and societies where the prosperity is increasing, those are very rare in human history. They're also very fragile and they can easily be broken up and go in a different direction. Why are they fragile from your perspective? All the issues we're talking about, I mean, some that, you know. Is it jealousy and envy ultimately in these kinds of societies where it's there's increasing prosperity, but you've got the $1.3 million house and your neighbor has the $1.25 million house and it's just driving you crazy? Yeah, that goes back to the conversation we were having just a little bit ago, but I think that actually is part of it. It's very easy for us to inflame our tribal jealousies. We seem almost psychologically primed to view if something goes wrong in my life, it's never my fault. It's your fault. It's somebody else's fault. And if something goes right in somebody else's life, it's never because of anything they did. It's because they were lucky or got a break that I should have gotten, et cetera. It's very easy for us to think that. And you can understand why. I mean, it makes it easier for us to accept both our own challenges we face in life. If we think that they're not our own fault, that makes us feel better about ourselves. And if we think that other people who are successful were successful through no deserving aspect or nothing that they deserved, then that makes us feel better about ourselves too. I mean, I think that's natural by behavioral psychologists. We call that the fundamental attribution bias, that we tend to view ourselves in the most favorable way possible, and we tend to view other people in less favorable ways. I think those are natural psychological instincts. But the problem comes when we start to solidify that, congeal that into contending groups or opposing parties. And if that gets connected to politics, that's very dangerous because then we can come to see, well, your success is because you're part of a group that I don't like. The other group says the same thing about our group. And once more and more people start to think in terms like that, then again, we see the world in zero some ways. So your success is not just good for you and maybe indirectly good for me too, but I see it as coming at my expense. And if you and I see each other's respective success as coming at the expense of the other, that can begin to engage not just jealousy or something, but resentment. And resentment, that can burn. That can really lead to all sorts of problems. That, I think, is one of the reasons why prosperity, why a general increase in prosperity and a peaceful society, why those things are rare, because people can all too easily divide themselves into groups against one another and begin to see the world in zero sum terms. I had a conversation yesterday, an in-person conversation. I will be very coy about details to protect his privacy, but an in-person conversation with one of the most wealthy individuals in the world. It was a random meeting. We're talking top 500. Random meeting, had no idea I was going to meet this individual. His background is one, not dissimilar to, he's not a tech guy, but a background not dissimilar to a Steve Jobs. He made a product, people bought it, they love the product, and he has an immense fortune. There's no doubt, I'm sure he probably worked his rear end off, but to get to be in that category when we have 7.5 billion people on the planet and to get to be perhaps one of the top 500, there's a little bit of luck involved. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. There's a little bit of luck involved. And I think a lot of people don't account for luck. If they do account for luck, they get angry about it. Me, I'm look at it. I'm like, I have the opportunity to chat with this guy and nice individual and fun conversation and learn some things. I don't begrudge luck. I don't begrudge his hard work. Where have we messed up in the teaching and understanding of luck? That's the first part of the question. And second, if luck allows the economic prosperity to get so large, is that potentially a bad thing? Like, for example, a Jeff Bezos? Let's take them in turn. So what do we do with luck? So if you think about anybody who was successful in life or is successful in life, 
will luck have played at least some role in their success? Absolutely. There's no question about that. People who are less successful in life, will bad luck have played some role in that? Absolutely. No question about that either. Luck is distributed throughout our lives in various ways, but maybe somewhat randomized, maybe not randomized. But luck definitely does play a part. But I would say two things about that. One is, if you think about somebody who's in the top 500 of wealth, and it becomes successful to that level, there will certainly have been luck involved, no question about it. But luck will be necessary, but not sufficient to explain the success. In other words, everybody who is successful in life, there will have been luck involved. And you will have got a lucky break here or there. You were lucky enough to have your parents send you to a good school, or you made an introduction, or like you, you just happened to meet somebody. All of those things are luck. But just having those lucky occurrences in your life isn't enough to make you successful. The other part of it is what you do with that. And that's what I think we have to keep in mind as well. It's not only luck, it's what you do with the luck. If I went to the details on my situation, my meetup, a lot of people without having a good foundational understanding would just be like, that's all luck. That's just an absolutely naive, ignorant, crazy way to think because I'm sure almost anybody that gets to that station and even let's say somebody that makes 50 million bucks or something. I mean, you make one decision and another decision and the decisions never stop. They never stop. You have to keep making decisions. It's not winning the lottery. You know? You've got to keep going. And it's hundreds of decisions a day for day after day. I mean, if you're going to create a business or generate a prosperity that could put you into the top 500, like this person you were talking to, that's going to mean tens of thousands of decisions you made over years and decades. I mean, there's no way that you just luck into a multi-billion dollar company. It's lots of decisions. And some of those are lucky. I mean, I remember years ago reading about one of the executives at Microsoft earlier in its career. He was talking about how, in retrospect, everybody said to us, this is when Microsoft was becoming Microsoft in the 80s and the 90s. He said, in retrospect, everybody said, oh my gosh, you guys seem to be profits. You just knew where the market was going to go. You just made all the right decisions. And he said, well, what you don't see is that in real time, we felt like we were on a raft going down a level five rapids. And we were just constantly saying, oh my God, watch out for that. Oh no, this. Oh no, that. They had no idea what was going to happen. And they made a lot of really bad decisions. And yet they were able to make some good decisions too. There's no getting around good or bad luck. It definitely does play a role. But the other part of it is, well, what are you going to do? And there are lots of cliched sayings about that. A good poker player is not somebody who always gets the best cards. Which cards you get might be a matter of luck, but the best poker players play whatever hand they get well. And I think that's something that not only is truer to the reality of people who are successful in an open economy or an open society, but I also think that putting it that way can give us some inspiration because no matter where you start, I'm the first person in my family to go to college. I was raised by a teenage mother and we were under the poverty line for a lot of the years of my life. It's true that some people start with things that are, in many ways, the luck is stacked against them. But in an open society, and this is what I think America at least aspires to be, is you still have the opportunity to try to make something to improve. The way to think about it is, I don't want to go from one to a hundred in one day. You want to go from one to two and from two to four. And these small incremental improvements in one's own life and one's own situation can ultimately lead to a sustained improvement. And when you have a society in which lots of people are engaging in those kinds of looking for ways to improve their situation, even if it's only marginally or incrementally, that can have a much greater effect on the overall society. I should note, without going in a linear path, we are touching on issues in your new book, Seven Deadly Economic Sins. And I must say at this point in time, we'll mention the book at the end again too, but I must say, I see a lot of books. This is not a one hour airplane read. <laughs> this is <laughs> got some grist to it. There's quite a bit of detail that we will not even get a chance to cover in this conversation, but I want to point that out for people. It's a deep dive. It really is. Let me bring up an issue, try and be controversial here for a second, privacy. I can go with you on the philosophical underpinnings, and I'm going to let you lay some of your foundation out. But I really think that privacy is toast, never coming back. I'm not saying I've done this yet, but I think 
that we could reach a point at some time in the future where we teach kids that one of the ways to deal with privacy is to put your naked picture online and just get it over with. Just get it over with because it's going to happen anyways. No. So just get it out there. Listen, the tech is unbeatable. Everything about us is going to be out there. Our fingerprints, our DNA, our naked pictures. So why not just put it all out there? You don't like it, but it's not an unplausible position. I basically concede everything you're saying. And I think the technologies that are gathering information about us are going to exceed basically any attempt at people preventing that from happening. There are going to be private entities and governmental entities, and there already are, who are going to know basically everything there is to know about you, whether you want them to or not. That's not even going to the what we ourselves voluntarily put on our Instagram feeds, et cetera. Even if you didn't have Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, it's still possible. I think this is your point, even right now, let alone in the future. But right now, it's possible to find out an awful lot about you. And it may well be that there really isn't anything that you can prevent people, no fact about you that you can prevent people from knowing in the future. I view that in a bit of dystopian features, but I think you're probably right about that. But here's what I would say. So let me make this argument and let's see what you think about this. One of the important aspects of developing a mature character as an individual is being able to develop one's own ideas, one's own values, and even one's own preferences. Part of that means picking the kinds of people and groups and associations that I want to be part of, which means that there are some that I don't want to be part of. Um, There are some people I don't want to be friends with. There are some groups that I don't want to associate with. There are others that I do. So when I talk about in the book, I talk about the importance of privacy. The philosophical part of that that I'm getting at is that in order for me to have a real sense of who I am, I have to be able to sort of put moral boundaries around my character in the sense that there are some kinds of behaviors I just don't want to engage in. There are some kinds of groups of people. That's not for me. I have to be able to draw these sort of moral fences. So when I say privacy is important, what I mean by that is that when an individual says, I don't want to be part of groups that believe that or that engage in those behaviors, that should be respected. It shouldn't be condemned. We shouldn't try to exile people from polite society for having individual identities. So when I talk about the importance of privacy, what I'm really talking about is a room or a scope of people being able to manifest their identities and live their lives according to the principles they want to develop and being respected for doing so. So I call that privacy, but it's really just showing respect for the uniqueness of each individual. Does that make sense to you? If you walk out into public and in the future there's technology, if you walk out of the McDonald's and you leave a straw there and some dystopian cellar dweller person is digging through trash and taking everyone's DNA because you're in a public place and they're taking a picture of you and they're matching up your straw with your picture and your DNA. And maybe there's also going to be some kind of a scanner in the not too distant future that can frankly look at what's going on inside your mind. All of this stuff is potential data, potential useful to somebody that wants to make a profit, maybe wants to cause one economic harm. Maybe these things, maybe we'll have to pay a fee to protect ourselves from these things. Back to the naked thing. I wasn't even implying naked in terms of untoward way. You know, you could just be somebody who's taking a shower and some kind of drone goes by your window. And the next thing you know, you're on the internet two seconds later. And once a picture of somebody makes it to the internet with no clothes on, it's game over. It just goes to too many places. It's a mind-numbing conundrum that we have built. I love all the advances and everything, but maybe some of the blockchain technology will give us some financial privacy in the future. Maybe that will help in some way. Maybe that will take some of the power away from governments and large corporations and give us a little more freedom, a little more uh, control over our agency, over us. But it's, it's a great unknown. It is a great unknown, and it's also a great experiment. This is really the first time there really isn't anywhere or there increasingly are fewer and fewer places for us to be able to retreat and have peace in our own minds or have a kind of private peace where we're not 
being gazed upon and being spectated upon by people, including anonymous people, people we don't even know who are watching us. And that's never been the case before in human history, because before these kinds of technologies, people, for the most part, lived in relatively small groups and they had relatively small circles that they turned in. So this is new and we don't really know what this is going to do to our moral sensibilities or to the way we relate to one another. We don't really know. You may be right that it could certainly be dystopian. And you, you mentioned somebody could find out these various facts about us because they want to sell us a product or tailor something to us. You know, And in those ways, maybe that's good. Maybe it's not so bad if Amazon is able to figure out exactly the kind of book I would like to read and they recommend to me the right kinds of books that otherwise I wouldn't have known about those books. Okay, that seems pretty benign. But human beings can be embarrassed and they can be ashamed. What do they get embarrassed about or ashamed about? Well, if they think or they have inner thoughts or just even curiosities or wonders that they don't want the world to know about, if suddenly the world knows about that, that can cause shame. And if that can cause shame, and if that part of our psychology doesn't go away, then people can use that against us. It's not just a worry about people wanting to seek a profit. I think it's also a worry about people wanting to seek power over us. If we can be shamed or embarrassed, people are able to get or entities, even governments, are able to get information about us that they know would shame us if it were made public, then that is a very powerful tool for controlling human behavior. And boy, you know, you talk about dystopia, that's something to worry about. You say in your book, you say the assumption, and I might be paraphrasing a little here, but you say the assumption is that we all want a just and humane society. I do not think after watching the last handful of years and watching frankly, the last year of America, when I hear the phrase, the assumption is that we'd all like to have a just and humane society. I don't think I'm being a pessimist when I start to really worry, and this gets back to my opening salvo about the word uh, moral, is that the definitions of just and humane are a slippery slope that seem to be going in all directions. And it seems like everyone's got their own definition of it. That's the part that scares me. It is, I will pass along, something that I like about being in an interesting country like Vietnam. There does seem to be, and every American out there can dislike me for saying this, there does seem to be something in this particular country that I'm in right now that reminds me of what America once was. There's absolutely a sweetness and an innocence that all you have to do is take one minute of cable TV news in America, whatever party, and there's nothing sweet or innocent that one can say about that. But that's a whole different conversation. The book, Seven Deadly Economic Sins, Obstacles to Prosperity and Happiness Every Citizen Should Know. And absolutely true. You really bring up some great stuff. We only touched on things today. People should definitely check that out. Hey, James, where can we send people? Where would you like them to go beyond the book? Again, Seven Deadly Economic Sins, Amazon and all that kind of fun stuff. Where would you like to direct people to if they want to find out more about you, other things you've written? I know this is not your first book. So where can we send them? Thank you for asking. They can go to my website. I've got a website. It's my name, jamesoddison.com. You can find information about my biography and other things that I've written. There's contact information for me there. So if somebody wants to follow up on something, including you, I'd be happy to continue the conversation. James, keep me posted on the next book. This is the kind of conversation, you know this, it's the kind of conversation, maybe with my personality too, we could probably just sit here with no questions and go on for hours and <laughs> yeah. hours and hours. And I think we could, yes. I didn't even get to the point that I grew up in Fairfax County, Virginia, outside DC, and I didn't even get a chance to fillet the federal government yet. That's kind of a side oh, tangent, but- uh, That's our next conversation. <laughs> yeah. Hey, James, I appreciate <laughs> it. Thanks for coming on. Thank you very much, Michael. It's been a real pleasure. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, 
trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.